Hello and welcome to Copy Traders Club, where you can learn how to make more money copy trading. I am Gavin McCauley, my name and username on eToro. Like you, I copy trade, and together we can learn from others how to do it better and have some fun. Here we go. Welcome to episode two of Copy Traders Club. Today is a regular episode, so it's just me chatting about eToro and my experience on it. You will no doubt be excited to hear that the next two episodes are conversations. First with my number one PI and second with the self-crowned number one copy trader on eToro. Those are good long episodes. Regular episodes like this one are much more bite size. I divide this episode into three parts. Part one, a moment of appreciation. Part two, Introduction to my portfolio. Part 3. What investing principles have I tried to apply to copy trading? Part 1. A moment of appreciation. The first thing I want to say on this episode is that I think that copy trading is amazing. And hats off to eToro for being the leader in the business. Now, I'm not naturally known for being really enthusiastic about things, but I'm pretty enthused about copy trading. So enthused that I started a podcast, which is not something I ever considered before. Listener, you may have been on the platform a while. Perhaps some of the shine has rubbed off over time, but it might be worth reflecting how great a facility it is to be able to copy trade. I only learned about it a few months ago and I'm still in a bit of a state of shock that this thing exists. That anyone can get started, put their money with some intelligent, educated, and accomplished investor at the click of a button is an awesome thing. And they don't charge you crippling management fees to do so. I've done the mutual funds thing and paid exorbitant financial advisor fees year in, year out. And let me tell you, this feels a whole lot better. I didn't have a clue about the person who was actually managing my money then. All I know is he was skimming off the top, rebalancing to justify his existence, performing to a pretty average level, and ultimately making more money off my money than I was. Certainly he was eating into any compound interest that I could have been making otherwise. eToro, on the other hand, is pretty close to free. Compared to the mutual fund setup, it's a real bargain. One good thing to think about is that your PIs work for you. Their job is to make you money. And yet it is your money that determines how they get paid by eToro. They work for you. Your money works for them. Talk about creating a win-win scenario. Prior to this, I thought shamelessly cloning mega investors was the best hack around. These top hedge funds have to submit their portfolios to the SEC no more than 45 days after the end of the quarter. They're known as 13F filings and are published every quarter on the 15th of February, May, August and November. They usually all come out at the last minute, so there's a big flood of them and everyone scrambles to see what the big cheeses have been up to. Specific dates of purchases or sales are not provided. So you can only guess by looking at the charts of the previous quarter what the price might have been. And you have to do all the research and analysis anyway, which is loads of work. By the time you've done all that and estimated intrinsic value and your strike price, it could be way different from the price the investor bought at. And you will only find out they sold it when the sale is on a 13F filing several weeks after they sold it. And again, that's plenty of time for the price to move against you. By contrast, with copy trading, you can buy the asset when your PI buys the asset, and it can be at the same price automatically. Then the same with the sale. You don't have to understand all the nuances of the investment thesis to decide when to sell. The PI does it for you. And you avoid all the stress of the emotional roller coaster, since the decisions are out of your hands. 
So all you have to do is find PIs who are the next Michael Burry or Bill Ackman. Easy. Honestly, feels to me like I'm kind of walking around a, on a spaceship or something. The kind of thing I couldn't have conceived of a few years ago. I'm just walking around in wide-eyed amazement. Now, I know it isn't perfect. Seatbelts are too tight, the bathrooms are small, the soap dispenser runs out too quickly. But it still is a spaceship. Whoever came up with this is a genius, and kudos to Itoro. On a fundamental level, the service they provide is great. They are growing at a breakneck speed recently, and are clearly having some growing pains, you know, there's no doubt about that. So it is far from perfect, but they do seem to be always striving to improve. So I'm not really interested in hearing people's complaints about eToro. I want this podcast to keep it real, but not to become a place for people to whine about the technical shortcomings of the platform. There are channels for that. I don't want this to be one. I just don't want to deal with that stuff. It really isn't of any interest to me. What is interesting to me is this new and underexplored branch of investing called copy trading. And I'm thrilled to be a part of that. Why I started this podcast was because I couldn't find the information I wanted to know. So this is my way of filling that hole. I think it'll be fun. And I think I could learn a lot and become better at copy trading. But it involves some work to be a copy trader. It's not remotely as much as doing the investing yourself. But it is also not no work. You can't expect that five minutes spent funding your account and thoughtlessly clicking a bunch of PIs to copy is going to be a masterful strategy that yields excellent results. Life just isn't like that. Copy trading is, I believe, a major disruptor when it comes to retail investing. And it's only really in its infancy. If copy trading is here to stay, I think it's going to take over a large portion of the retail investing space. Why? Because there's potential to do very well without that much effort. And we all want that, right? Coming up in part two, intro to my portfolio. Part two, intro to my portfolio. Gavin McCauley is my username. My pick is the Copy Traders Club logo. I'm something of a greenhorn when it comes to copy trading, and definitely a greenhorn when it comes to podcasting. Hence the green horns on the logo. It could also be because I am an Irishman of Viking descent. Macaulay originally meant son of Olaf, apparently. So, any number of reasons for the green horns? As for my portfolio, you don't have to go and look at it physically, gentle listener. I will paint a picture. I joined eToro at the very end of November 2020, so statistically I started out with a small red month, but things have gone pretty well since. The standout month is January with a ridiculous 23.84% return. This is thanks to my two main PIs posting a raft of solid results, but there was one standout reason which will be discussed in the next episode. So I've started really strongly. I don't expect uh, the rate of growth to continue, of course, but I'm excited to see where the journey goes. I currently have a risk score of mostly three or four. Okay, so let's have a quick look at my PIs. At the time of recording, three of my four PIs are in the green. One is very slightly in the red. It may have changed by the time this goes out and certainly by the time you're listening to it. So I only have four PIs, essentially two equities guys, one Forex crypto and commodities guy, and one volatility guy. For me, that's enough diversification among asset classes. It balances nicely with my finances outside of eToro, which is the important thing. 
Many, I imagine, will be horrified that I only have four PIs. My initial cash allocation among them is something like 5.5 to 2.5 to 1 to 1. In other words, I have over half my bank with one PI. Is that madness? A lot of commentary and advice I read in eToro land would suggest that it is. But is it? Where does this perceived wisdom come from? Where does the risk lie? These are the types of things that I'm here to explore and challenge. I might be wrong, and I'm open to being convinced of it. Does anyone have all the answers? I came to eToro because of my lead PI, Samosa King, a.k.a. Karan Mohan. I knew him from other value investing circles on YouTube, and we had exchanged ideas and communicated a fair bit before I realised he was on eToro and I could copy him. I won't go into too much detail because the exciting news is he is visiting the Copy Traders Clubhouse in episode 3 for a good long chat. But essentially, I came to eToro just for him. To harness his intelligence and ability and let the man I call the Millennial Monish grow my money for free. I still can't quite believe that's possible. After a little while on eToro, I became convinced that there might be others worth adding to my PI list rather than having all my eggs in one of the finest baskets I've ever come across. I had also seen Robert Merck on YouTube when I was researching Dropbox as a potential investment, and his videos are incredible. Just so impressive. Then he too mentioned eToro in one of his videos, and I thought, Wow, I get to have him in my life too. Fantastic. So I added him. A chat with him is coming up in episode 6. As I was learning all about the platform, and having worked my way through dozens of Tom West's videos on his YouTube channel, Social Trading Vlog, I stumbled upon the peerless YouTube videos that begin like this. Hello. This is Andrew Haddon, otherwise known as Felix Falix on eToro. What a gold mine of insight he provides. If you learn one thing from this episode, it's that you need to be subscribed to his videos. I will put the link in the show notes to both those YouTube channels, so you can do so after the end of this episode. I was persuaded that a little asset diversification stroke hedging was a wise move, and that there were other solid PIs out there. Honest, steady, intelligent people getting returns from positions other than in stocks and ETFs. And so Trade Better and Elite Vol joined my crack team of copy commandos. An Indian, an Irishman, a Spaniard and a Belgian. I'm delighted to have them all. Some I know better than others at this point, but I hope to talk to each of them during the course of making this show. Coming up in part three, what investing principles have informed my copy trading choices? Hey, hope you're enjoying today's show. I'm sure you've subscribed already. If you're a successful copy trader, happy to share what you've learned. There's no need to have a public profile. Please get in touch. Otherwise, listener, the bigger the club, the better for you. So tell people on eToro about this show. Ask your PIs to come on. That way you will get to know them better. We build this club together. Part 3. What investing principles have informed my copy trading choices? My decisions stem from the fact that For the last few years, I've been reading lots of books about investing, specifically Rule 1 style investing. Books on or by Phil Town and Danielle Town, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Monish Pabrai and Guy Spear. Also some of the classics like those by Howard Marks and Peter Lynch. The key to modern value investing is finding underpriced businesses that I conclude will not only be around in 8-10 years, but will be much bigger than they are today. 
So, you know, going through the four M's of meaning, moat, management, and margin of safety. That's a short way of describing what can become a colossal amount of work. It also involves a concentrated portfolio rather than a huge list of stocks in businesses you cannot possibly keep track of. So I think I'm applying whichever of these elements can apply to my copy trading practice. For example, if you take meaning, I'm trying to understand who the PI is in the way that you would try and understand the business behind a particular stock. I'm trying to ignore the hype and see the person. I want to choose PIs carefully based on who they are, not just 2020 stats to the moon. I'm trying to avoid the hype and get in sensible, capable people who I can really get behind. The kind of PIs I can have confidence in that they will do the right thing. This is a scary time to be selecting PIs, really. There are so many lucky idiots out there. Guys who may have done brilliantly in 2020, but not because they are brilliant. They went after the sexy stocks, and 2020 was an amazing time for sexy stocks. But nothing stays sexy forever, as my full-length mirror likes to remind me. I don't want my money in the hands of some Johnny-come-lately flyboy who might do something stupid and blow my cash by going big with leverage on the next Nicola. Ask yourself, could there be such PIs in your list? None of my guys would do such a thing. Of that, I am as sure as I can be. Some PIs are super communicative and are uploading new videos to YouTube all the time. I find that with those, it's very easy to feel like you're getting to know these PIs. But many PIs don't do that, and I think it's a mistake. I think those that are an open book are far more likely to attract copiers. You want to know what you're investing in when you buy a stock. In copy trading, you want to know who you're investing in. But the main thrust of what I wanted to talk about in this episode is the idea of the holding period. The type of value investing I was attracted to is that which has a distant time horizon. You have to allow time for the investment thesis to play out. The business has to emerge from the event that has caused its price to have been suppressed. It needs time to flourish and then compound that growth year on year before it can be said to have fulfilled its goal as an investment. Many PIs say, for best results, copy me for the long term. Many copy traders ignore this. I suspect this is one of the main reasons why copy traders don't succeed in the long run. Howard Marks, who I will be quoting liberally in this podcast, said this. If you stand at a bus stop, eventually you'll catch a bus. But if you run from bus stop to bus stop, you may never catch a bus. That's a cute analogy, but there is evidence for it, most famously with the Magellan Fund, run by Peter Lynch, who I will also be quoting liberally in this podcast. I'm going to read a little bit here from an article uh, written by Michael Torrance on the website alphawealthfunds.com. Try saying that after a few beers. Alpha Wealth Funds. And this article features, quote, a study on the Magellan Fund from 1977 to 1990 during Peter Lynch's tenure. His average return during this period was 29%. This is a remarkable return over the 13-year period. He was easily one of the best performing fund managers for his asset class. If we can just stop there, 29% per year, average, 13 years. And he was one of the best. How can that be, you say, when you see eToro full of 80% returns in 2020? The answer is consistency. How many of these 2020 heroes will be able to look back in 2033 and say their average was more 
than Peter Lynch. On with the quote. Magellan Fund became one of the largest mutual funds due to its success under Peter Lynch, so it is clear that investors were aware of its performance. Whether the investors in the fund were chasing performance or investing due to his expertise is unclear. What is clear is that investors learned that Peter Lynch was investing in a method that worked. Given all that, you would expect that the investors in his fund made substantial returns over that period. However, what Fidelity Investments found in their study was shocking. The average investor in the fund actually lost money. You read that correctly. The average investor lost money in the Fidelity Magellan Fund under Peter Lynch's tenure during a period of time when the fund returned around 29% annually. So if investors can learn enough to find good investments, why do they consistently perform poorly with their investments? He goes on to say, I have a few theories on this. The most obvious one is that investors act emotionally. They jump in and out of investments based on their short-term results. Investments go down, they get scared and sell at the bottom. The reverse is just as likely. They see headlines about the market going up and get greedy and want to jump on the train. They buy at the top. End of quote. There's no way of knowing exactly where the market is right now, although most seem to agree we're closer to a top than a bottom. But what are the takeaways from this for copy traders? The main point here is not to hop around like a frog on a hot road trying to land on a PI who will give you the best return this month. That's not the game I intend to play. I want to get to know my guys and give them time to get on with it. Unless something significantly changes, I intend to stick with these four PIs for at least a year. This is just my opinion. I'm open to hearing others and I invite you to counter this. Also, if you think about it, and you resolve to jump frequently, especially when there are red months, then does that not mean you're locking in red months, effectively seeking them out? If you stay put, you might ride through a red month or two, followed by a long line of green months. If you jump on the first red month, you might join someone else who has a red month in the first three, so you jump again and you might land on another red month straight off, Also, if your PI is buying undervalued stocks, they might well go down a bit more before they turn around. When copying someone and copying open trades, there's a fair chance you will kick off with a red month. That is normal. On a number of your PI's best growers, you're getting in at potentially a late stage and the prices could easily go down. So an immediate red month is absolutely no cause for concern. But if you're jumping around all over the place after a couple of months, you're locking in those first red months, left, right and centre. A red month here and there is similarly no big deal. There could be a load of reasons why your PI's portfolio could take a little dip now and then. It's the overall performance that matters. To give you a real example from eToro, This is an extract from popular investor Wesley's website. From his FAQ page, I want to tempt to see the freaking accent. Question, how long should I copy for? Answer, some copiers have trouble sticking with any investment, not just copies, for more than a few days. You're almost guaranteed to lose money this way. It has been shown that investors that trade more frequently Make less money. Make your investment and walk away. I suggest a minimum copy period of 6 to 12 months. Here are what your historic returns would have been for different copy durations if you'd copied me with $10,000. 6 months, $14,000. 12 months, $16,700. 2 years, $25,700. Since I started on eToro in 2015, $77,100.
I heart compound interest. So that's Wesley's view. It seems pretty obvious to me that you do need to stick with people for a number of years. Let them do their thing. Give time for businesses or positions they hold to grow. I cannot believe that any short-term hopping policy is a good idea. If you disagree, let me know. One thought that has crossed my mind concerning holding periods with PIs on eToro is that there may be some merit in the idea that there's an ideal holding period for the average PI. Now, I haven't studied the data here, but imagine you concluded that a good rule of thumb is that a PI has up to three strong years before a bad year. Could there be a workable strategy that involves being on board for the good years and then hopping off when there's a stronger chance that a bad year may be coming? And then you could hop to a PI who looks like they could be towards the start of their good three-year run? You could be hopping off a growth guy and onto a value guy or a volatility guy or any combination of those. I mean, it would take some knowledge and no small amount of luck to get it right. But unlike short-term hopping around, I can at least conceive of how a PI wave-riding strategy like this might work. In fact, I have seen it said that more than half of the elite PIs from five years ago are no longer on the platform. That suggests that there will be, indeed, down years every few. No one gets it right forever. Often the bad run can be catastrophic, terminal. That suggests that for a copy trader to make sustained year-on-year wins, some hopping is essential. I mean, I need to know more about it before even thinking of attempting it myself. I have a feeling I might move into that sort of an approach in the years to come. Who knows? But there are lots of copy traders out there. Someone somewhere must be attempting this type of strategy. If that is you, or you know someone who is, let me know. So, that concludes my musings for this episode. Can you add to these initial thoughts? Do you agree with me? Am I talking absolute bollocks? Please let me know. Contact details in the show notes. Cheers. Coming up in the next episode, a lovely and very informative chat with my main PI on eToro, Karan Mohan. That connection that you know, I'm able to invest and generate returns for so many people. It's, it's really meaningful to me. It's a very interesting conversation and definitely worth checking out. That's it for today, listener. Thanks for being here. Until we meet again at Copy Traders Club, I wish you many happy returns. <laughs>